Hi guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to Introduction to Rust. This is video three. In the past two videos, we talked about literals and collections of literals, things like arrays, tuples, strings. In this video, we're going to go into ownership. Before we actually talk about what ownership is, we kind of need to touch on how other programming languages deal with memory management and specifically how memory management actually works. Here is an illustration of the stack and the heap. So the stack and the heap are both of the parts of memory that are available to your code to use at runtime. The stack stores values in order to get them and then removes the values in the opposite order. So for instance, if we put in like a number, it would go down to the bottom here from the top so we would enter and then go to the bottom and then if the computer needs the number it would come grab it from the bottom and pull it out of the top you could think of it like you put like an array in here and, and like say like the first index is down here and the last index is up here you would say okay well the first came in first and then the last gets pulled out first and this is called pushing into the stack and popping off of the stack the stack is fast because the cpu never has to search for a place to put new data or a place to get the data from because the place is always from the top of the stack if the uh, cpu comes to grab a piece of data it's always pulling off the top the data is always in a known fixed size in rust all of the literals like the integers the booleans and the slice of strings these are stored on the stack. For more complicated data, we have the heap. So you can kind of think of the heap as like just kind of a pile of memory. So you have a big pile of memory and a bunch of pointers that point to various memory locations. The heap is a little bit slower than the stack because the CPU has to follow a pointer down to where the actual data is being stored. These data storages could potentially get larger, you know, and uh, they could potentially be more complicated than what's already on the stack. Suffice to say that the heap is slower than the stack. So if you think about languages like C++ and C and even basic, you have the ability to directly and indirectly actually manage the memory in these languages. C++ and C both have pointers and they have references that you can deal with and you can do all kinds of things with these. But at the same time, there is a element of danger inherent in being able to manually manage the pointers and the references. For instance, if you create two pointers which point to the same piece of data and then you dereference both of those pointers, you could cause memory corruption. So higher level languages like Java and C Sharp and you know, Python and Ruby use what's called a garbage collector. Garbage collector is essentially an algorithm that moves around, finds all the free memory, and then releases it automatically. With Rust, however, we have something in the middle, and that's called ownership. So ownership follows three rules. Each variable has a value, and the variable itself is called an owner. So if we create a variable here called x, we'll set it equal to 1. We can say here that x owns 1. And in this case, because one is a literal, it's stored on the stack, not the heap. Each piece of data can only have one owner at a time. So X owns one. When the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. So for instance, if we create a new scope referenced by these two curly brackets and we say, let a equal 10, and then we try to do something with a outside of these curly brackets, for instance, uh, X plus a, we're going to have a problem because A is not actually in the scope out here. And as you can see here, the error is starting to pop up and it says, can I find A in this scope? And that's because A only exists from when we define it here till this uh, actual curly bracket here. So if we take A and we put it outside of the curly bracket here or even up here, then it is actually in the scope. And so you can even make multiple curly brackets like this, and then you're making multiple scopes. Now, this isn't exactly how you would code things in Rust, but it's just a good way of showing the very basics of ownership. So ownership becomes even more important when we're dealing with more complex types that are stored on the heap. So let's look at this example. We define a string here with the uh, variable s. So s owns the string at this point. Then we say, okay, we want to bind s to y. So we're saying, y equals s and now we're going to try and print out s but as you can see here 
we actually get an error that says we're trying to use moved value s. So what essentially is happening is we're actually moving the reference from s to y with this statement here. And after that, the actual reference of s disappears entirely from the scope. Only one reference can own a piece of data at a time. And in this case, that's exactly what's going on. Now, of course, to fix this, we use what's called borrowing. We can say y equals our reference to s. And what this essentially does is it says, okay, we want y to borrow s for a moment. And that's exactly what happens. So now if we actually run this application, it will print out string when we reference s here. So we're going to actually look at uh, some more complicated examples and they'll use some things that we haven't really talked about yet. Don't really worry about them. I'll explain all the stuff that you really need to know here. All right. So on a microscopic level here, we create our resource. So we define in the heap, we say we want to have a vector of a dynamic size and then we actually put the data into the vector. So then when we call take, we're transferring the ownership from the main function to the take function, and then we never return the ownership back to the main function. This is what is called moving, because we're actually moving the resource from one function to the next function. We also have the ability to do something called copying, which we'll look at right now. All right, so here's an example of copying. So we have our main function and we define two integers and then we pass them into this function. Now, unlike the string value that we had before, they don't actually become unallocated in the main function. Like they still exist here. That's because they're not actually being moved. Instead, they're being copied. So A and B are being copied because they exist on the stack and not the heap. And because it's not inefficient to do it this way, we actually copy them so that they exist in the scope scope of the cop function here and they still exist in the main scope as well. If we run this, we see here it says 77, which is of course the sum of 32 and 45. And then we print out we have A and B here. All right, so with the concept of ownership comes the concept of borrowing. There are multiple ways to sort of think about borrowing. Essentially borrowing lets us have multiple references to a resource while it's still adhering to the single owner, single place of responsibility rule. They're sort of similar to pointers in other languages like Go or C. A reference is also an object. So uh, mutable references are moved and immutable references are copied. When a reference is dropped, the borrow ends. So essentially the uh, reference disappears from the scope. And of course we can affect this with another concept that we'll get into later called lifetime. So in simple cases, references will behave just like when we're moving ownership between a function and another function. So let's look at an example of this. So here we have three functions. We have one called re, one called borrow one, one called borrow two. So re takes in a vector and then it returns a vector and the vector has I32 uh, elements in it. And you can see here that we print out uh, the 120th plus the 111 value inside of our vector. And then we return V. Then we have borrow one and borrow two, and we'll get to those here in a moment. Let's look at our main function. So in our main function, we make a mutable vector again, and then we push a thousand values into it. Then we call our re function. So our borrow one function takes in a reference to the vector. So you can see here that we're using this and sign and this and signed in the type annotation. And then we have our print LN macro and inside of it, we're using parentheses and then an asterisk and then the actual vector. So this is a pointer to the reference of vector. And then we're calling the actual element that we want. So 10 and 12. And then we have our borrow to function, which again takes in a reference to vector. But this time we actually just called directly V and V11 instead of calling a pointer here. This is the more idiomatic way of doing things because uh, for instance, if I put a reference on both of these, it's not going to show us the uh, actual memory reference value in the print. It's just going to automatically follow that reference to the actual data value. So if we run this here, you can see it actually prints out as we would predictably uh, assume it would, even though I changed those other ones to uh, and signs. And if I remove the and signs here, you'll see that it, it'll print out exactly the same. So again, it, it prints out 233 and then we still own the vector and we prove it by printing out two of the elements. 
then we print out 24 and then we still own it and then we print out 23 and we still own it. So what's actually happening here for the re function? We're transferring ownership to the re function and then it transfers ownership back. And that's why we have V equals re V. So by returning the value back, we're actually returning ownership back into the main function. Now let's look at another example that's slightly uh, more complicated in a few ways. Let's create an actual vector using the vector bang um, macro. And we'll just throw in some random values here. And then let's create a for loop. And we're going to loop to loop over our reference to V. And we're going to say R equals count. And in this case, we're going to set in our reference to our vector. And then we're going to call I on it. And then we're going to call println. We're going to print out I is repeated R times. And I forgot my semicolon here. And now let's create the count function. So you don't really need to know what's going on with this function, except that it's just taking in the reference to the vector and the value and then returning a U size. When we run this program, you can see here it says four is repeated four times, five is repeated two times, three is repeated two times, etc., etc. What it's essentially doing is it's going through each element here counting the number of times it appears inside of the vector and then printing it out. And the important part of this is that we are not actually transferring ownership of this vector. Instead, we're just uh, using the reference here to send it into this loop first and then send it into the function. And then we have two borrows active at the same time. So the loop borrows and then the function borrows. And even when we get outside of this, we can actually just call a println on uh, one of the values in V, say V of one, and this would be fine. You can see here it comes back as five, and that's because V is uh, still exists until main terminates. All right, so before I actually finish with the tutorial, I just wanted to clarify something slightly. Um, there's been a little bit of confusion uh, with regards to the string types in Rust. A string is an own string buffer, and a slice of string, or a string slice, is a view into a string buffer that exists in memory. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial, and I hope ownership was not as complicated as I made it sound. Keep in mind that ownership is something that is sort of integral to Rust, and as we keep going, we'll sort of build on this concept more and more, and we'll keep referring back to it. So even if you didn't fully understand it with this video, that's fine because there are certainly more aspects to it that we'll go over as we keep going. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to subscribe and like. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment. And if you dislike this video, then by all means hit the down vote. All right, guys, we'll have a good night.